verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. And this is his prayer. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And then we hear and see the publican. Verse number 13 said, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. If you go back and you read in the original language before the translation into the King James language, you would see that where the Bible says here, as to me a sinner, the original interpretation really should have been unto me, or rather he says merciful to me, the sinner, the sinner. I don't know about you, but that just puts a whole different spin on it. And I want to read it to you again. He says, the Bible says that he would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now look at verse number 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I'd like to talk to us for a while on something that I believe may help us on our daily walk with God speak to us in a very personal way. I'd like to preach tonight on the wrong way, the wrong way to approach God. We you stretch your heart and hand to God and ask God to have his way? Lord, tonight we're thankful for the power that is in the word of God. We ask you tonight, God, to speak directly to us and we'll give you praise and honor and glory for every good thing that is accomplished in this service. Lord, let me not waste any valuable time tonight, but let the words that I speak, let them contain power and life to the hearer and we'll give you praise for everything you do. And everyone can say amen. If you're watching online or listening online, share the video or the audio with your family and friends on social media. The Bible here would tell us a very powerful story. From this one parable, Jesus has given many different parables. We see this even from the same chapter. But from this one parable, we learn what I'm going to call tonight what not to do. You know, I found that in marriage and in many other areas of life that there's sometimes it's not so much somebody telling you what to do. Sometimes it's knowing what not to do. I found that in marriage there are some things you do not say. There are things you don't do. Come on and say amen and help me preach a little while. There are some things you just don't do. And I read here in this passage how this, this particular parable would relay to us how that we not waste energy and effort and time and come out empty-handed and rejected by God. Because the truth is, that is, I can just speak for myself personally, the last thing that I would want to do is spend a lifetime of serving God, giving Him all of my life, or I feel that I'm doing that, and be approaching it all the wrong ways. Anybody else feel the same way? If I'm going to serve God, I want to do it the right way. I don't want to feel like uh, that I get to the end of the race and somehow that I may hear the Lord say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I would rather that if I'm going to extend Spend the energy and the effort and the time and the motivation that all of my intentions are pleasing to the Lord. If anybody else feels the same way, say amen. 
You see, it is possible for you and for me tonight to invest and participate in the kingdom of God and in kingdom work and waste a lot of effort and a lot of energy and intention and do it all the wrong way and approach God all the wrong way. Have you ever felt like as long as you've been serving God that you've seen anybody that has done that before? You wanted to be able to just put your arm around them and give them a little pep talk and let them know, listen, you're seeing it through the wrong eyes or you're going about it the wrong way. You're approaching the altar the wrong way. But sometimes we don't feel that we have the right to do that. Say amen. But you see, sadly, there are people and there will be people that have sat on church pews. There will be some that have paid tithes and they've given in offerings and some that have volunteered to help around the church and some that have even worked in a ministry capacity and sadly they will not make it into heaven and their spirit because of the spirit that is behind their motivation and their ambition they will not make it across the gates and into heaven celestial city somebody say God help all of us well I don't know about you but I would I, I would not want to serve God for many years and stand before the presence of God in the day of judgment and hear the Lord tell me, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And you say, Pastor Mars, her spirit and attitude was not pleasing to God. That same woman one night, well, one day we come out of church. We were standing right in front of the church doors. And that morning I had preached about being fishers of men. We were trying to grow the church to the conclusion that I've just thrown my fishing pole has a problem with that. We're talking that paid tithes faithfully and regularly. We're talking about a woman that was in church for a really long time. But I can tell you that's not pleasing to God. And you know, when I read this parable, the initial purpose of this parable was to address an attitude and a specific spirit that had apparently affected some that were in that crowd that day. If you read the very first verse that we read tonight, verse number nine, it said, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. You know, in other words, they had confidence in what they did. They had self-righteousness involved in who they were and all they'd done for God. I've met people around the church because they donated the church piano or because they did something around the church or they bought the plants or they did something that all of a sudden they felt like they were on a merit system with God and the more system of merit points they got, the higher on the rung of ladders they climbed and they had the right to look down on everybody else. Have you ever met anybody like that? Those kind of people will drive off more people in the church than you can get to come to church. Those kind of people have destroyed more churches than ISIS Amen. and any other religious faction that is against Christianity bar none because they will divide and devour the church. Can somebody say God help us? You see as I, as much as I can tell you that I appreciate my early beginnings as a child of God in the holiness movement. I thank God for holiness. I believe that every child of God ought to seek to be holy, ought to seek to live holy, ought to seek to think holy, ought to seek to do every part of their life ought to be holy because God said be you holy because I am holy. How many of you agree with that? Our, our desire ought to be to get out of the filth of sin that he's saved us from and live upright before God and holy. And I can tell you tonight as much as I thank God for my holiness roots and those early beginnings, there were things I saw that are not pleasing to God and I've had to come away with the mindset there's got to be a balance somewhere here. There's got to be somewhere in the middle of that road because I met some that were so far on one extreme there were nobody saved but them. And then I met some that are on the other side of the road in the ditch who you can live any way you want and do anything you want and you're still safe. Am I still preaching the truth somebody? But I 
got saved uh, and I came up, cut my teeth uh, in the holiness movement. Thank God for that. But I remember times uh, as I rode to church, my mind began to go back. And I remember I had long been called to preach. Uh, and I began to travel around to different camp meetings. Uh, I remember one time I went to one particular uh, camp meeting and I, at the end of that service, my pastor back home had told me, he said, well, if you want to get your name out there, let people know who you are. In other words, get your business card, whatever, you know, made up, introduce yourself, don't push yourself on anybody, and if they feel like uh, having you come preach, you know, it be a great idea. And so I thought, well, praise God, fantastic. So the service was over, and they were having food in the fellowship or reception hall, and I went in there, and it was a camp meeting, and so there were a lot of representing pastors and preachers and churches and leaders and such as that, and there was one particular table where sat many different preachers, uh, some that I'd heard their names, uh, some of them I'd listened to them on cassette, and I had great revere and reverence for these men. I thought, you know, I had such respect for these men, and I went, Brother Roy, and I sat down at the table beside this group of men, uh, but I quickly felt like, I felt like the odd man out, uh, and if I'd ever felt like uh, that I didn't belong there, I felt that way that day. I sat down, and they looked at me, and I began to try to make conversation. But after a while, I felt like uh, the best thing for me to do was find another crowd that will accept me because obviously I have not arrived yet because you've never heard of me and you don't know who I am. Uh, and so, but I'm going to tell you what I found uh, about some of those that were too good. Uh, a few days, months, years went by and I kept on preaching the gospel and then all of a sudden some of the same kind of preachers uh, who didn't want nothing to do with me back when because they had never heard of me. All of a sudden, they want Brother Myers to come preach their service or their revival. Now you want me to come, but I wasn't good enough back then. Let me tell you that, such as that, is a stench in the nostrils of God. Can somebody say man? And it set a bad taste in my mouth. As a young Christian, I began to realize uh, that not everybody that is in this is in it for the right reason. And if there's anything uh, that touches my heart, if there's anything that moves me, amen, it's not how good a person preaches. Uh, it's not so much how good they sing. Uh, I love good singing and I love good preaching. But there's one commodity that is a shortage in the church today. And it's one word. It starts with S. Uh, sincerity. Can you say that with me tonight? Sincerity. There are so many people that do what they do for the wrong reason. One night right here at the Gray Street Church, I hadn't been pastoring here long. Uh, we were having a monthly sing uh, and right here on this very platform uh, I thought the man was joking. I kind of laughed uh, but I quickly realized uh, he was just as serious as he could be. I, somebody in the crowd said, "Good brother so and so sing tonight. And I looked around to him uh, and I said, would you like to sing tonight uh, with a stale face uh, about as stale as a loaf of bread been out open in a, for a month on the counter. Just stale as he could be. There ain't enough people here tonight for me to sing. Somebody got a problem with that besides me. I thought he had to be joking. So I kind of chuckled. But he didn't laugh. Because he wasn't joking. I thought I'd heard it all. Somebody say amen. But how many of you know there's a right way to approach God? The day that we think we're Mr. and Mrs. Big Britches, that we've done all and we've done so much, or we've got the stars and stripes, or we've earned a certain level of merit, is the day that God's going to look at us and say, it's time for me to bring you down a few notches. You think you're somebody, let me show you. You ain't nobody. All of our righteousness was as filthy rags. And like I preached here a few weeks ago, God dropped pull us all out of the same trash can. If I'm preaching right, say amen, somebody. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. There's a, there's a big polar opposite that Jesus is pointing out in this passage with these two different men. You see, I want us to get acquainted with these different types of men, if you will. One, the Bible tells us, is a publican. I want you to understand what a publican is. 
How many of you remember when we talked about Zacchaeus and he climbed up the little sycamore tree because as the one little kid song said, for the Lord he wanted to see. You remember that? He was just a wee little man. But Zacchaeus was a publican, a tax collector. That's what a publican is. I don't know about you, but I can't stand taxes. Anybody else say amen? I ain't real excited about taxes uh, and I never met anybody that was. But one thing I can tell you, a publican was a type in their day of a subcontractor who worked for the Roman government to collect taxes. The reason why I want to point this out to you is that when Jesus told that parable, that very day, these people lived in that society. They lived during that era of time. So they very well identified with everything that Jesus said. But you and I have never met a publican. So I want to kind of give you an idea of what kind of person we're talking about. Have you ever heard about loan sharks or people that are a type of subcontractor? if you will and they were a middle man between somebody well these tax collectors uh, they worked like a type of subcontractor for the Roman government to go collect the taxes many times these, these men would rake up or hike up the amount of money sometimes as much as three times the amount now here in the state of Florida we may have six and a half or seven percent tax can you imagine paying three times that just because a tax collector showed up at your door and he felt like he was owed that because the more they hiked it up, the more money that they got to fill their pockets. So in the city streets, everybody hated the publican. Everybody despised the, the ground that he walked on. Truth be told, if they could, they'd have spit right in his face. They hated the publican and he was often thought of as an extortioner, somebody that was taking money from innocent people that did not deserve it and it was seen as a stench in the nostrils of the people and God. But I can tell you that same man, I want you to see this same man in this parable that Jesus gives that church or that crowd that day. He has walked into a place for a time of prayer. He's walked into the holy temple right into the very place where the people reserve for the holy holiness of God. They revered the temple as the place where God might meet with man. Well, you know, in that same temple, there just happened to be another man that Jesus gave in a parable. And this man was a Pharisee. The Pharisee belonged to a sect of religious men that had a strict code of adherence to the Levitical laws and also certain traditions of the elders of that day. These men thought that they were the best thing walking most time. But one thing I can tell you that often starts out in the beginning, it starts out right. In the beginning, they start out with good intentions. But after a while, it goes to their head. Many of them started out doing things uh, for the right reason. If you'd have met a Pharisee on the streets of the city, you'd have seen a man dressed in a certain particular outfit on his arm or his wrist. You'd have seen a phylactery and that had a, was a little leather box it just like you see in that picture right there and on the forehead was a leather box and in those little boxes uh, they contained passages from the Levitical law and what they would do is that they were supposed to get up in the morning open that little box and read those passages to themselves when they started out it had the right intention to keep a man straight to keep a man's path right but after a while it became a showboating thing when they were in public it was more like look at me look at what I'm doing let me pull out my passage let me read right here in front of the crowd so everybody can see how spiritual I am everybody can see what a man of God that I am have you ever met anybody like that I'm going to tell you such is a stench in God's nose somebody say amen but that Pharisee, they had those phylacteries on their forehead and on their arms. And there were two specific days that that Pharisee would fast during the week. You know, you could pick pretty much any day you wanted. 
Some say there was a religious tie as to why that they would fast on certain days. They really only had to fast once a year during a certain time. But they picked Monday and Thursday as the day that they would fast. Just so coincidentally, that was the day that everybody went to the market. You ever read in the Word of God where he talks about fasting and he said when you fast... There was a certain way that you were to do it. Why? Because Jesus had seen the same foolishness that I'm preaching to you about tonight. It became a showboating. It became a high exaltation. Look at me and look what I've done. I met a lot of people in the church world just like that. You remember what I told you that the word of God said? It said he spake this parable unto them which trusted in themselves and that they were righteous and they despised other people. They began to put confidence in what they did for God. I mean, I got phylacteries. I got the outfit. I got the uniform. I got it going on. I'm a somebody. I've been in this thing a long time. What about you? I've been serving God for X amount of years. How about you? You ever met anybody like that? How many of you believe tonight that God accepts humility and rejects pride? There is a wrong way to approach God. If at any given point of your Christian walk that you ever find yourself exalting yourself by merit or because you've been in this a long time, or you find yourself a place on a church pew and you think that you, somebody, you're some divine necessity from heaven and so nobody better sit in your spot because you, you don't own no spot in here. Come on now and say amen. I know how it is. There are places I like to sit. I, there's times when I was a member of a church, there was a certain place I preferred to sit. But I've met people before that would get downright ugly with you. And I think, why are you even at church with an attitude like that? You need to go straight to the altar. Come on now. Over a, over a seat. Something's wrong in the house of God when our attitude gets like that. And I'll tell you, the Bible said pride goeth forward before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The moment that you begin to rise up where you think you're somebody. Well, you know how much money I've given to this church. You know how many bills I've paid. You know how many times uh, that I've built this and fixed that and how many church services I've been at when nobody else was here. Such is foolishness in the eyes of God. You better be be careful when you approach God like that. Can you say amen? I want to tell you tonight, this man came before God in the most ungodly manner. He began to trust in everything he was and everything he did. Pastor Myers, are you sure about that? Well, I want you to listen to what he prayed or how he prayed. Take a look at the way this man prayed. Verse 11 and verse number 12, and I want to read this to you. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Did you get that? He prayed with him himself. When Jesus gave this parable, it was specifically designed with detail. This man prayed with himself. I have seen times before that people are praying to an abstract God. They're not really praying to God, but I've seen people in prayer meetings. As a young Christian, I fell victim to do the same foolishness myself. When you get in a room full of people and you begin to pray loud because, well, Everybody can hear you. And the louder you pray and the better you pray, maybe the more spiritual you are. But all such is foolishness before God. And God does not want us to approach him like that. I'm not telling you praying loud is wrong. I'm telling you praying with the wrong spirit is wrong. And if you get down on that altar and you're just speaking words because it's time to pray. And if you're not really talking to God, it's just as foolish as us using the name of God in vain. We've got to be very careful the way that we approach God and approach the altar at God. Can somebody say amen to that? But the Bible said that that man prayed thus with himself. 
God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I want you to get a visual picture in your mind. You have two men, this Pharisee, this self-righteous man trusting in every righteous thing he's ever done in God. This man goes to the altar. He goes to the front of the church, to the temple. In the background is this publican tax collector. Sister Amanda, he's walked in. He knows he's not just a sinner. He is the sinner. He's got his head held down in humility. This man, we don't know. We just have to assume he may have never paid tithes or may have not paid tithes on a faithful basis. He has no phylacteries to brag of. He has no leather box on his head or his arm to brag of. He may not be able to recite the passage of the Levitical law like somebody else can. He may not have on the garments or the right robe on like the Pharisee does. But he stands in what some call the court of the Gentiles, an area far off in the temple, almost as if to say, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel righteous or worthy to go before the altar of God. I'm a lowly sinner man, and I know that I am. There ought to be an attitude of every child of God. I thank God for the blood, don't you? I thank God for salvation. But we ought to all have an attitude that if it were not for the blood, they ain't one of us that deserve to be here. And one of us deserve to pray in an altar. And one of us deserve to stand before the holy presence of a holy God. I know that may not be popular with some people, but it's the truth anyhow. But this man has the audacity to approach God like this. And this man says, God, I just want to thank you. Can you imagine Thanking God is a good thing. Saying, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. That's not what this man was doing. This man goes on a tirade of, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I thank you that I'm not like extortioners and unjust and adulterers. And Then he takes it to a whole other level. And he turns and looks at this man in the back. Thank God that I'm not like this publican. God, that just wrenches my stomach. Somebody agree that that is sad. I've met people just like that, and if you tried to tell them, they would disagree with you all day long that they were not wrong. They were not, they were not doing anything wrong. They would say, oh, I'm not doing anything wrong at all. Do you know I'm faithful to church? And I'm, I pay my tithes. I'm not telling you any of that's wrong. I'm telling you the spirit and the way we approach it can easily be wrong. There's going to be people that have sat on church pews and paid tithes faithfully. They've been there for fundraisers. They've showed up and supported. They've raised their hand. They shouted amen during revivals. They're not going to make it because they have approached God. In a self-righteous manner. Sometimes we can start out with the right motivation. I could say, well, I'm going to start having a prayer meeting at my house at 3 o'clock every day. Anybody that wants to come. And it could start out to be a good thing. And then after a while, I start getting lifted up with pride. Like, this is my prayer meeting. You understand what I'm saying? There are things that you and I can do and become lifted up with arrogance and pride that is not acceptable unto God. I remember I hadn't long been saved. And I was on the job site one day. And this man that I met, he began to tell me about his sick daughter. And he said he got tired of seeing his daughter sick. He said, so I went before God one day and I fell on my face and I said, God, you can either do something about this or I'm not going to serve you anymore. I was not brought up in the church. 
And I don't mean from a child. I mean in my salvation experience. I was not taught that that is how we approach God. And I, I didn't want to say anything controversial. But I looked at the man and I said, you said what to God? He said, well, sometimes you just got to get bold with God. I'd much rather go before God and say, Lord, I sure would like it. I sure would appreciate it if you would. So, Pastor, is that Bible? Do you remember how Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? He set the tone for humility when he said, Not my will, but thy will be done. He said, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. But if not, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We've got to approach God with the greatest humility. We've got to learn to come before God with the right spirit and the right approach. How many of you say, God, I want my prayers answered. Listen, if you want your prayers answered, get your mind on God when you're down there praying. Don't have your mind on five other things. Uh, God's too holy for that. God deserves more respect than that. Let me tell you, if you just look at your wife from across the room while you're talking to another man and out of the side of your mouth you say babe I love you it don't have the same tone or experience uh, when you look her in the whites of the eyes uh, and you say honey I love you with everything within me and she can feel it and sense it how many of you know tonight I believe uh, that God knows when we're serious the word of God says one place Jesus was telling the church he said they profess with their lips heart is far from me. I want to preach this other man's story to you. This tax collector, the Bible says, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, the sinner. Can you see him? Can you see that man that everybody hates? That man that's got a reputation. Two men with a reputation. One man's got a religious reputation. The other one's got a reputation that nobody wants. That man stands off in the background, won't even lift up his eyes. And he begins to smote upon his chest. God. Be merciful unto me, a sinner. Do you know that the most important thing you need to understand in all of this is the way Jesus weighed the outcome? Because it's not up to Pastor Myers to say who goes, who don't, who's right, who's wrong, who had the best prayer, who wasn't praying right, who was. But God is the one that weighs it all out because God can see down below. He knows what's in you. He knows the very motivation of your heart and why you do what you do. God knows the spirit behind it. And you know what the Lord said in verse number 14? This is the words of Jesus Christ, the one you say you serve. He said, I tell you, this man, talking about that publican, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know what God was saying? It doesn't matter that you think you've got it all together. It doesn't matter that you've been in this all your life. I'm glad for that. That's great. It's great that you're obedient and you keep the law. You keep the law right close to you. You read it often and all of that. But if you ain't got the right spirit on the day of judgment there will be sinners that came in at the last minute that were sincere with God who were so much not even lift up their eyes smote upon their breast and said God be merciful unto me I know I'm a sinner that man knew he did not deserve to be there he knew it sometimes we need a mirror check not a crowd check. Sometimes we size ourselves up by the crowd, not the mirror. 
there are times that it's easy to look around and say, well, I've, I've been in church more than anybody. I haven't missed paying my tithes all year long. Every time I call out, I, I answer every one of them. I listen to them. I pray for my pastor all the time. All those are great things. Somebody say amen. Let me tell you, you're not on a merit system. The humility will help move mountains in front of you. We must remember, as the scripture said, such were some of you. Pastor Myers, why did Jesus say that we need to come before him as a child? Because in the innocence of a small child, it represents the early stages of life. Sometimes a lot is lost as people begin to grow and mature in Christianity. Sometimes they lose their way. Because let me tell you, if the devil can't pull you down, he'll push you up. What do you mean, Brother Myers? How many have ever had the enemy come along and try to beat you down so bad that you feel just like you can't make it? You feel like the lowest person on the pole. You don't even deserve to be in church. I don't even know why you get up in that choir and try to sing. I don't even know what you think you're doing. Anybody ever had the devil do that to you? If the devil can't pull you down, he'll push you up. He'll allow you to have praises of men. Then he'll get in your ear. There have been plenty of people who come up in church with the right motivation and intention. The celebrity, stardom, hit them. They become big, a big name, a household name, and before you know it, they're traveling around singing. They're traveling around doing what they do for all the wrong reasons. And it becomes a job. Let me tell you about ministry. If you're here and you're called to ministry, you're listening tonight, ministry is a calling. It is not a career. I said ministry is not a career. It's a calling. And when God calls you into the ministry, there's only one thing to do, and that is to be faithful in that calling and have frequent mirror checks between you and God. Anybody besides me ever have one of those times where God allows you front and center, to see how you ain't got it together. I laid in the hospital a few years back, had my gallbladder removed. <coughs> I'd never had a surgery procedure before. When I went in, I don't remember anything from the time they were wheeling me down the hallway till the time I woke up in a room. And some of you may laugh, but when the surgeon came in, I said, why can't I remember anything? He said, well, we gave you some versit. I knew what that was. I'd heard about that before. I've been around hospitals as a pastor. That wipes your memory out, so they don't remember. I said, well, you tell me something now. Tell me the truth. I said, y'all drop me off the table or something. Y'all didn't want me to remember what happened. Y'all stick me in the wrong place or pull the wrong thing out or leave something inside of me. And he got to laughing, and he said, no. He said, we just do that, he said, for the whole process and the trauma of things, you know, such as that. Well, I thought everything was going to be great. But I started getting real sick. At one time, they had uh, eight or nine bags of different antibiotics, different type fluids and antibiotics going into me at one time because I had a pocket of fluid that they could not figure out what it was where they removed that gallbladder, and I got sick. They sent me home, and when I got home, I got the chills so bad, my whole body would shake so bad I couldn't even talk. My wife got me back to the hospital, and when they brought me in, Man, I was sick. And that same surgeon came into my bedroom or into that hospital room. And he stood at the foot of my bed and he looked at me. 
I don't know about you, but I'm very observant. I watch people's facial expressions. And when this man that did the surgery procedure, I want to see some confidence in your face because if you ain't looking confident, I don't feel confident either. Come on now. And I'm looking at his face. and He don't look too confident. And I said, Doc, am I going to be okay? And he hung his head down. He said, well, I don't really know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, well, you've got a pocket of fluid there, and if it's, if it's bacteria, if it's this, that, and the other, it could be a fatal thing. Let me tell you something, folks. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, my whole frame of mind changed. Something happened to me that day that I'll probably never forget. Here I'm laying there, Brother Claypool. I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. As a young preacher, I'm telling everybody to just get over it. Whenever they struggle with anxiety, they had a demon. I mean, every kind of thing as a young preacher. I'd never dealt with any of this stuff, so it was easy to preach. You know what I'm saying. And now here I am laying in a hospital bed, and my faith wasn't too much there. I had another pastor that came in, and he grabbed a hold of my foot. Come on, Brother Myers, you just got to believe God. You got to have faith. And there I'm laying in the hospital bed, and I wanted to have faith, but for some reason I just didn't feel very confident at the moment. That's reality. I said, that's reality. And you know what God allowed me to do, Brother Coon? He allowed me to realize no matter how much you preach, no matter how long you've been pastoring that church, you're susceptible to, to be in the same position as any one of them people you preach to. They'll all tell me, just have faith. And I realize real quick, it's so easy to tell somebody to just have faith than it is to actually have faith. But I want to tell you something. God has a way of getting a man or a woman's attention to allow them to see the weakness in their walk. I wonder tonight, is there any one of us with an area of weakness in our walk? A place that God could reveal to us and say, you don't really line up here. Your manner of conversation is not holy. Your way of thinking has not been holy. Your motive is not right. How many of you know that the motive behind why we do what we do is more important than any one of us can ever understand or estimate? Why you do what you do. I'm going to tell you tonight, there's a right way and there is a wrong way to approach God. Will you stand to your feet tonight? Two complete polar opposites. Two complete extremes. How about the next time that we look at somebody else who looks like that they just can't get their act together? How about the next time we say, God, have mercy on them? How about the next time you look at someone who just seems like they fall all over their self? God, you're the ultimate judge. I pray you'll show them mercy and I pray they'll get their life right. Don't ever 